All right, commonly used medications. Uh, normally a pharmacist would give this presentation. So complete disclaimer, I am not a pharmacist. Um, however, there are a lot of concepts from a nursing perspective that are gonna be relevant to you that we didn't wanna miss. They will be joining us for the next presentation, but um, unfortunately due to staffing and some uh, scheduling, we uh, have me. So anyway, I'll give it um, a pretty concerted effort. I, I knew this was coming, so it's not like I didn't do my homework. But just, again, bear in mind, I am not a pharmacist. I'm a nurse, for those who didn't know. All right, disclaimer, no financial conflict of interest, uh, just like with any of the other presentations through Burn Course. We do, especially in this presentation, talk about specific manufacturers of medications, um, and then also not just trade or generic names, but trade names. Some of it is because medicines don't have a generic name just yet. Um, but again, this is because of how we treat our patients, not necessarily endorsing any specific product. I wish they would pay me, but they won't. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Alright, we're going to understand the role of the pharmacy in patient care. We'll introduce medications frequently utilized in burn care and understand how to safely provide medications to burn patients. So I want to mention, these patients really suffer from polypharmacy. I mean, we are giving them sometimes upwards of 40, 50, 60 different drugs every single day. That's a lot of medication, and I know they all have their purpose, but it's a lot of stuff for you to learn and for you to understand what kind of interactions are these medications gonna have for the treatment plan, but then also with each other and all those spices for good health that we got from our cultural perspective uh, presentation. So, oh my gosh, talk about hard to manage all of these different things. Now one, I guess, silver lining in that high use of medications is that you'll see those same medications used over and over and over again. Now, that's not always true. I mean, we know with our antibiotics, for example, that you want a very specific type of antibiotic based on whatever the patient's condition warrants. And so we're doing those you know, cultures to then determine uh, what our treatment plan would be. Um, but things like vitamins, which we give a lot of, you may see the same vitamins being given across the board where the only difference is the weight-based dosing that comes along with it. So know that over time you'll become more familiar. You certainly won't get it all in a 20-minute presentation, um, but, but with experience uh, comes knowledge. Also, please do not give medicine unless you know what it's for and then any potential side effects that may come along with it. Um, you are essentially, as a nurse, the end of the line, right? So the physician orders a medication where it's indicated, the pharmacist will go and do verification of that medicine, but then you're the one who delivers it. And then once it's in, it's you know near impossible to take it out. And so just know, especially if it's something that you're not familiar with, you know there, there can be consequences, and it's a lot easier to fix it on the front end rather than after it's been administered. I'm not trying to scare you, it's just there's all of these different medications out there. We wanna ensure that we are using them safely. A little bit about our pharmacy. We're open from 6.30 to five o'clock, Monday to through Friday. Um, and then actually they come in on the weekends as well. They're here from 7 a.m. until really the inpatient needs are met. In general, our outpatient population don't have pharmacy needs over the weekend. That's not always true, which Rebecca can probably attest to because we've had to chase down some medicine for something. Um, but uh, they're here really to ensure our inpatient needs are met, which makes sense with our 24-7 inpatient unit. You can reach them at 6806. Uh, oh, and by the way, they're on call. So even when they're not here physically during their pharmacy hours, if you have a late night admission, and they need that critical medicine that's not already within the OmniCell, which is a drug dispensing drawer that we have, then you can call the pharmacist and they will be here in two hours or less. And usually it's much faster than that, but um, someone's always on hand, close by, on call, in the event that uh, some, some medication is needed. Well, that may be the case and they're happy to come in. So what's the order process look like? Well, there's really two different tracks. One is in this perfect world, right? Y'all remember like the, the world of NCLEX where it was like, oh, answer it like the NCLEX hospital, which, you know, isn't always the reality. In fact, more often than not, it's not the NCLEX hospital. 
Well, there's two different tracks with how we order medicine as well. One is the physician order. This is the ideal track. This would be, okay, we've gone in, we've done our assessment of the patient, here's some condition that warrants the need for medicine. The physician writes the order, the pharmacist verifies it, and the nurse delivers it, right? No harm, no foul. Well, just like the world of NCLEX, sometimes things get turned upside down, and we have to deliver medicine in an emergency situation. Now there's really, actually, that can kind of break down into a couple different tracks as well. It could be something like um, a code situation. So we are gonna do our PALS class on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, in that situation, you essentially have standing orders for the medicine that you're gonna give. So could you imagine having a code and the doctors at the computer having to write, okay, we're gonna give Epi. Oh wait, here five minutes has passed, we're gonna give another Epi. And has to write it every time. Like the codes would have much poorer outcomes, right? It just doesn't even make sense. So you have your PALS algorithm, you follow the PALS algorithm, and you're able to give emergency medications, okay? So that's one tract. The other tract is that your provider might be in a situation where they cannot actually write the order, whatever it may be. Usually we classify this as an emergency situation. So for example, um, I'm needing pain medicine for my patient. And that could be a critical thing. I mean, I mean, who are we kidding, right? Like, your patient's in a lot of pain. It can impact so much. But the, for the provider can't get in. They're scrubbed in for a surgery or something. You can't get a hold of any provider. It's the middle of the night, whatever. So in that case, they can give you a verbal order, okay? Now, it's got to be either a fellow or an attending that's giving it to you. And you have to be able to read it back, and they verify yes and you can go put that order in under a verbal order. Now obviously that's not our first tier, right? We wanna try to get with the provider to do it, but to meet the needs of the patient, you've gotta find that balance point. So you can order for uh, emergency medications in that kind of scenario, um, but the provider truly needs to be unable to write the order. It can't be like, oh, I'm in the call room and I'm half asleep. Well, too bad, you know, the, the patient needs help. And I'm not saying that happens, just, um, it would have to be some scenario in which they're not able to actually write the order. All right, so we're going to, uh, or we, the pharmacy is going to review the medications. You're also going to do the same. So we do our six rights, which I'll talk more about in the next slide. Pharmacy also does their own check and balance. So the physician orders it, and they're kind of the layer between, you know, the physician and the patient as far as you know, do, are we giving the right drug for the right reasons, at the right dose, the right frequency? Um, is there any therapeutic duplication? So one good example is itch medicine, right? Like we give Benadryl and Atarax and Hydroxazine and um, gosh, what's the other one? Gabapentin and I mean, you name it, right? We've like hit them all. Well, they actually all work on different, um, you know, like nerve, uh, on different nervous tracts in your body. And so, actually, there's not therapeutic duplication, even though you might think. Now, if instead we are um, prescribing the patient fluoxetine, and then they introduce, in addition, uh, some other SSRI, like, um, I don't know, Zoloft, right? Well, there would be therapeutic duplication. You could run into issues like serotonin syndrome in that example. So pharmacy is gonna help create that check and balance as well. Um, any real or potential allergies or sensitivities? Um, one nice thing about the electronic medical record is that you dial in all the patient's allergies, you dial in all of the medications or, or what's getting ordered, and then it, it'll cross-reference to try to find things, not necessarily just, oh, this person's allergic to morphine. Well, people that are allergic to morphine tend to have allergies with you know, other opiates, you know, for example. And so the EMAR helps, Pharmacy will increase and uh, bolster that, that process as well. Um, any interactions between the prescription and other medications or food? So maybe we bring in all those natural remedies that they had. Maybe there's some drugs that they, they're taking over the counter to supplement with what's going on. So they can help us determine, hey, there's some interaction that could potentially lead to, to harm's way. Grapefruit juice, again, it's kind of like the classic example. Current or potential impact is evidenced by laboratory values. So what's gonna happen, right? If I go and I give uh, potassium chloride to someone that's hyperkalemic, 
right? I'm going to push them over the edge and they're only, you know, going to get sicker and might car cause some cardiac issues. So they're looking at kind of, you know, are we giving this for the right reason? Are we going to benefit or harm the patient? And then any other potential contraindications of which, I mean, I can't even imagine all, like the pharmacokinetics and how drugs interact in the body and how many that we give. I mean, there really is this balancing act to all of it. So where do we come in? Is the bedside RN? Remember with high alert medications, two RNs need to verify. And some of them, it's pretty clear, right? So like, oh, for my insulin drips, for a heparin drip, well, yeah, it's high alert. It's the one I have to sign two nurses on, right? Well, actually, things like your narcotics are also high alert medications. You know, morphine dose, two milligrams is typically how the vials come out. And for a 100 kilo kid, no big deal, right? Boom, two, two milligrams of morphine, they'll kind of laugh at you like, is that it? Um, whereas if you gave that two milligrams to a three month old, you could have some serious complications from it, right? And so even though morphine is something we give a lot of, unfortunately, because of the amount of pain that some of our patients experience, it's still considered a high alert medication. You should still do verification. Um, and that doesn't just happen at the waist. It's you know when we recall the order and that kind of thing. So uh, other verification includes uh, independent visual confirmation of the physician order and the following. Okay, so and there's your six rights: right patient using two identifiers, right medication, right dose and infusion rate, right route, right time and frequency, and then the right indication or the right reason. Um, also the uh, two alert before I forget. So two nurse verification. It's happening, let's say you pulled out an insulin drip, the two nurse verify, not just to ensure that the concentration is good, and they should, oh, I'm gonna run it at this rate. Really, the second nurse who verifies should follow that nurse and then watch them program it at the pump as well. That way you can really ensure from pharmacy to patient, no discrepancies will be met. And you don't have to do this with every medication, but certainly these high alert meds. Guardrails is a feature that's built into the Alaris pumps. Um, this is essentially a, a safety net. It's probably one of the most critical pieces of software that we use, um, especially considering we just we treat a lot of high need critical patients. So essentially what it is, it's, it's software built into the Alaris pump that allows you to dial in the medication that you're going to give. So for example, I'm going to give vancomycin. Um, generally, it comes in a 500 milligram per 500 ml dose. No, that's not right. 500 milligram to 100 ml uh, dose concentration. So I'm going to go and I program it in my pump, and it's going to ask me, okay, are you going through a central venous line or a PIV? And we're doing more PIVs lately. So, okay, PIV, great. So I hit PIV, I dial in my concentration, and it'll tell me, you're good to go. Concentration, rate, everything's fine. Now, let's say I pulled out my dose because, you know, my patient had a central line before. Now it's a PIV. Well, I dial in on guardrails that, hey, I've got a PIV, but I'm giving it at a 1,000 milligrams to 100 ml, so a 10 to 1 dose, which is your cent central line concentration. Well, when I go to dial in guardrails, it's going to say, hey, hold on. That's not the right dosing concentrations. Now, sometimes it'll ask you, are you sure you want to continue? You hit yes. And it goes into like this yellow screen where it's essentially like cautioning you, like, hey, hey, this isn't exactly right, but you said it was okay, so hey, we're moving on. Or it may actually prevent you from moving ahead at all, where sometimes it'll say, um, sorry, but the drug con concentration or the volume you put in or the rate at which you dialed it in is too high or too low, and we're not gonna let you go forward. So it's essentially a hard stop on the pump. Now, that should be an extremely rare occurrence. I know it does happen with some medications. If you do notice it, report it to pharmacy so we can verify it, sure. But also, they can update that guardrails formulary so that next time you dial it in, it shows up fine. Um, this is a very, very powerful software suite. We can update it as we add new medication into the formulary but it doesn't do any good if you don't use it. So please, please make sure you use it. This is a huge safety feature. And let me tell you, from personal experience, this thing will keep you out of trouble when it comes to managing your drips, okay? This and then tracing your lines. 
don't forget to trace your lines. All right, so medications. Antibiotics, um, we give a whole lot of, um, and we're also good stewards of antibiotics. However, uh, just the nature of burn injury with infection being the biggest issue that we have, it, it's just an unfortunate consequence to what we do. We do treat our patients prophylactically if they're a major burn injury. Essentially what you're looking for is both gram positive and gram negative coverage uh, with antibiotics until we have definitive cultures back that are gonna tell us exactly what that patient's growing. Um, before surgery, we also give antibiotics. That's true not just for your acute patients, but also if you have your surgical patients that are coming in six years later. Now are we gonna slam them with those you know, heavy duty you know, onslaught antibiotics? Mm, not quite. Um, we might give them some Bactrim instead of vancomycin, but uh, still, they do have that antibiotic coverage because as we know, surgical intervention, there's a risk for infection. Um, also, so this is gonna be kind of an interesting concept. Um, I did a lot of policy review before I came so I could teach you the latest stuff, right? And they're actually recommending now that we hang the antibiotic at the time it's scheduled or it as close as possible. Now, you don't wanna delay treatment, right? So I'm not saying wait till six o'clock and then boom, when you know it's only 12 o'clock. But if it was ordered at 12 and it's 12.30, well, we can give it at 12.30 and then maybe six hours later, which puts us at six o'clock, well, it would be 6.30 if we kept our timeline, but you can kind of stagger back at that point to get back on track. So instead of giving it at 6.30, Maybe we give it at 6.15, and then by midnight, we're giving it on the hour, every hour. So you wanna stagger where it's possible, especially with the antibiotics. And there's actually a frequency schedule that we want you to try to adhere to as much as possible. This can be very difficult, especially with polypharmacy. So this is something that you try to do. It may not apply to every case, um, especially as things get complicated when you have you know, two or three different antibiotics going at the same time that you wouldn't want to give all um, concurrently together. So anyway, this is the, the frequency schedule. Um, do remember when you're staggering, you've got to stay within 30 minutes plus or minus the time it was given, okay? So say we're two hours behind, we're not gonna jump from two hours to, okay, we're back on time. We're gonna use that 30 minutes so that like maybe over the course of a day or two, we get closer and closer to that time we're trying to give it. Um, one thing which I didn't put in my slides, but I do wanna mention, don't ever have medicine at 7A or 7P on our ICU. That's at shift change. And the reason you don't wanna do that is because day shift's gonna think night shift's got it. Night shift's gonna think day shift's got it. And then the patient doesn't get, get the medicine. Also, because it's shift change, it's a little harder to keep close eye on your patients. So if you're given something like vancomycin and they end up with a red man syndrome, you may not notice it right away. Because shift change, there's so many things happening. We're giving a report. We should do bedside report if we're not already. But um, just if you can avoid medicine at shift change, that's uh, usually a good thing. All right, we talked about the uh, administration times. Remember, please don't, don't delay. Uh, trying to, to stagger. And, and remember also you only have that 30 minute window to play with. All right, so what are the gram positive organisms that we see? Uh, Streptococcus, um, Staphylococcus, aureus, MRSA is the big one. Uh, Enterococcus, um, just not, not our big, big offenders, right? Like Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Acinetobacter bomani. Uh, but these are still important, but like think about, you don't hear about MRSA that much in the burn world, right? Well, a lot of it is because of just the nature of burn injury. We are like clean, clean, clean freaks, um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, also, with the systemic antibiotics that we're giving, pretty heavy hitting stuff, um, largely, knock on wood, we've been able to avoid um, issues like MRSA. Now, some of your gram-positive uh, antibiotics include vancomycin at doses between 10 and 15 mg per kg. Um, we give that Q6 hours. Usually, sometimes you'll see a, like a Q8 or Q12 mg, but it's pretty rare. Uh, generally, you want to give it uh, 
at least one hour, sometimes up to two, especially with your PIV concentrations, you may want to take a little bit longer um, because uh, with PIVs you can definitely um, cause some issues uh, that you won't have with Decentraline. Um, we do draw troughs, bank troughs on this, so not only are we responsible for giving the medicine, we want to give it for the right reason. So what a trough level does is it essentially measures the amount of uh, drug in the patient's blood at a certain time point. And we want to draw the trough one hour before your vancomycin is due, okay? Now I know part of the problem is your troughs can take up to 30 minutes to arrive. But you really want to get that time point exactly one hour before when you do the draw. That way, hopefully it's ready to go by the time you get your medicine ready and you're going to give it to your patient. But you don't want to give it if that trough is over 15, okay? And honestly, we've seen them up to like 30 and 40. A lot of times in those cases, it's not so much that the patient was overdosed, but they're having trouble with renal clearance. And so it could be an early sign of renal insufficiency. Perhaps your patient's on dialysis and you're like, well, that makes sense. But um, we want to be very, very cautious with VANC especially. Now, does anyone know some of the side effects of bank toxicity? I talked about one earlier. It's really more of an allergy than a side effect. But that red man syndrome, so like flushing, which that can be true with any antibiotic. Another thing is ototoxicity, which is something we don't hear about a whole lot. Ha ha ha! Get it? Um, but uh, ototoxicity. So if we end up overdosing these patients, not only are they a burn survivor, but now they can't hardly hear, uh, which is only like insult to injury. So um, please, please make sure the reason we check troughs on uh, vancomycin is because um, in this patient population especially, there's a higher propensity for them to not be able to clear it effectively, and therefore we could easily um, end up overdosing. All right, gram negative. Like I said, these are the nasty ones. Um, these are like, uh, oh God, I hate to use a burn pun. I was gonna say a slow burner, but haha, -ha burns, right? Um, these have a longer time of onset. How's that? And uh, generally, you know, take a little bit longer to come into play, and then they strike just extremely uh, aggressively at that point. Um, e. coli is something we have in our gut. I mean, there's literally trillions of them crawling around right now. Um, actually, for the most part, E. coli is relatively harmless. Um, there, there are certainly some strains, you know, you don't want to eat the salad that's contaminated and that kind of thing. But what's happened is a lot of times when we're giving antibiotics, you're wiping out the normal flora of the gut. And so what's left are these, um, these resistant pathogenic bugs that are going to go in and cause damage. And so it could certainly be E. coli. Um, and we, we've seen that sometimes. But more, than, more often than not, it's Klebsiella, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Enterobacters, uh, we also have some issues with, um, but by and large, uh, yeah, those, those two are the killers, um, especially Klebsiella pneumoniae. Uh, just particularly bad bug. Um, it doesn't just cause pneumonia, we have like these extreme wound infections as well. So, we got to have our gram negative coverage too. Promaxin is probably the one you guys are really familiar with. Uh, Imipenem psilostatin is the generic name for that one. Uh, if the kid's under 12, then it's 18.5 milligrams per kg per dose every six hours. Uh, and then over 12, you'll see 12.5 mg per kg per dose every six hours as well. But there is a max dose limit of 500 um, for every dose. And we want to give Promaxin over 30 minutes, which is a little bit faster than our vancomycin. And sadly, especially if you have a patient with one lumen and you've got multiple antibiotics, you'll find that you have to kind of stagger your antibiotics in order to give them all. And that actually should be an important consideration because let's say I'm the offgoing nurse and Kimmy's the oncoming nurse. So I gave my Promaxin before my bank. And I did it, you know, 30 minutes we were done, then we could start the bank and let it run an hour and a half, no problem, they were due at the same time. Well, Kimmy decides, no, I'm gonna do it, do the bank first and do the, do the Promaxin. So that's part of why you wanna like maintain the same schedule and talk about like how we stagger the schedule. And if you can avoid antibiotics at the same time, 
It's not always true. And so in this case, in my handoff, I'd say, hey, Kimmy, I gave the Promaxin first instead of the Vank. And maybe you have a good rationale, maybe not, but it's important information for her to know because that's not something that's clearly marked in the EMAR. Like you could really, you could go in and look at the exact time it was administered and that kind of thing. But those are those communication points that are really important when it comes to talking about drugs, especially antibiotics. Meropenem is another gram negative antibiotic. Generally, we see 20 to 40 mg per kg per dose on that, max, gram of two, max dose of two grams. That's another one we give over 30 minutes. Astrionum or Azactum, uh, never heard of Azactum, but that's the trade name. Uh, it's 20 to 40 mg per kg per dose, also over 30 minutes. All right, this is content uh, that Justin just covered, stuff I'm a little more familiar with as well. Sodium hypochlorite is also known as your Dakin solution. It is a great wash. Um, it's particularly good at doing good wound coverage without being cytotoxic, so it doesn't um, damage healthy cells. The problem with Dakin's, very short acting. So it's only good maybe 15 to 30 minutes of you know, activity or availability when you use it. After that, it's pretty much useless. So whereas things like silver nitrate, um, maphenite acetate sulfamylon, those tend to last two to three hours or have like microbiology killing properties for two to three hours, whereas your Dakin's are very quick. It's like a flash versus something that's a little longer. Nitrate's silver-based. Um, we use it, you know, it stains the skin black. I don't know if he mentioned this in the presentation, but one thing I used to do, I would take the surgical diagram and I'd make a copy of it. And I'd keep that copy on my medication desk and then I would refer back to that. And I, I wish I could tell you I knew every patient, every wound, where everything was. But the truth, I mean, if we've got so many things that were, you know, going on in our minds. So I don't hold it against you. Don't hold it against me. Cheat. Use the tool that's there. Make a copy. Put it in your room. And then you have this guide that will tell you exactly where not just the wounds are, but the donor site. You know, you talked about how the donor site, you don't want to be wet. Well, don't soak it. And so you have this, this sheet, this guide to help you through that. Maffinite acetate, great sulfamylon. It works extremely well. However, uh, two things. One, it's expensive, which, you know, that's fine. If it works great, doesn't matter. But uh, people can have an allergy to it. And so you want to be careful. Sulfa is uh, the big thing there. It's in the trade name, not this one. Um, but uh, just be mindful of that if your patient has sulfa allergies. Also, um, we're not really quite sure which one's better. We've done studies to compare silver and sulfamylon to see is one more effective than the other. It's come up inconclusive. They would literally soak half the body with silver and half with sulfamylon, and we had similar outcomes. Now, you want to avoid total soak with silver, <laughs> one, because you're going to stain these kids with black all over the place. Um, but also, and, and I don't know if it's like well defined, but silver, you can have silver toxicity as well. So um, we do switch it up. Even though silver is the gold standard in burn care, it's not the only wound treatment that we utilize. Polymyco is actually something we made up at Shriners. Um, it's a mix of trade drugs, including um, polymyxin, which is like a, a broad spectrum antibiotic ointment. Uh, mycostatin, which is an antifungal powder, and then they use nystatin as well. And so, <laughs> literally, this is kind of weird to think about. The pharmacy has a large stand mixer, so for all the bakers out there, you know, this is kind of like heaven on earth. This thing is huge, and uh, it goes and it stirs all this together, and then, you know, our end product is that little jar of polymyco that we get, and then that gets put into a fine mesh gauze a lot of times, and that then becomes your dressing. And so not only do you have something that acts as a barrier between all your bulky dressings and the patient's skin or the wounds, but you have something that's got antimicrobial properties. Oh, and by the way, it actually lets stuff seep through. So it ended up being a pretty smart burn dressing that does a lot of things for us, which is why we see it so often. Silvamyco is actually coming out of favor. We used to use it a lot in the burn world um, for a few things. They would use it if they wouldn't excise the burn, so if they left the eschar on, 
very, very good antimicrobial properties. The problem is it can be cytotoxic, which is why you wouldn't want to use it on like a fresh graft, for example. We would also use it over donor site. So donor site on like day four or five it would be healed to a certain extent, and then we could cover it with silvomyco, and it would help the healing process to prevent infection, and then also to kind of get the scalp ready for um, the next um, skin donor. But we don't see silvomyco as much. Have you guys seen it at all in practice? Yeah, so it's really, it's falling out of favor. So who knows, maybe on the next one we'll uh, not even be talking about it anymore. But that's part of that evolution of burn care. You know, it, it changes over time. We find better treatment modalities. Um, like I mentioned with Silvamyco, uh, we would put it on donor site. Well, we were putting it on a donor site called Scarlet Red, which we don't use that at all anymore. It's been replaced largely by uh, Xeroform, um, which serves a similar purpose has different properties, but the end results are the same, um, and it can be either more cost effective, or more importantly, better for the patient. All right, pain. Speaking of better for the patient, we want to ensure our patients are having as little pain that's, you know, realistically as possible. Acetaminophen, um, we can actually use that for background pain. Um, it's not the most effective, but it actually has a lot more strength than people give it credit for. Um, that dose is 15 mg per kg per dose uh, with a max of 4 grams per day. Now, why do we have a max dose on acetaminophen? Anyone? Liver failure. Liver failure, exactly right. So, um, it's important to note um, not only Tylenol has acetaminophen, but also like our Lortab elixir, like our Norco, um, you know, those all start acetaminophen. And so that upper dose limit, we have to have those considerations as well. Um, we try to avoid having two orders of medicines that have acetaminophen. So you would either have Tylenol or Lortab. They wouldn't be ordered together. If you do notice that, please call attention to it because the way our EMAR works, it won't calculate the Lortab plus the Tylenol towards that max four gram dose. So that's an important thing to think about. Morphine, all right, we give a lot of it. Um, like I said, it's a high alert medication. We wanna be careful, even though we give a lot of it. Um, dose is 0 0.05 mg per kg uh, every dose, generally every two to four hours. Um, it's an opiate. Uh, it has pretty quick acting effect, but you really, if you're gonna do a procedure, you don't wanna like give it and start going. Usually it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to start reaching its peak. So, well, yes, they get kind of that euphoric uh, appearance right after you give it. The, the max that you'll have for pain reduction is actually a little bit after that. Methadone, you want to talk about falling out of favor. I heard this was a hot debate in rounds the other day. So generally, we're giving, we gave methadone for um, background pain. And it wasn't something that was prescribed across the board, but uh, we would see that a lot of patients, they did okay, but having methadone on board, they did great. They really thrived. It wasn't like pain all the time, and I'm just kind of working through everything. They, they felt good. And the nice thing about having methadone in addition to morphine, and maybe in addition to Tylenol or acetaminophen, is that you're taking like a multimodal approach to pain. And that's good. So, you know, the body has all these different pathways on which, you know, pain travels. And if we can interrupt that signal from a few different angles, well, maybe we can make this traumatic experience a little less so, right? And I think that's, you know, all of our goals at the end of the day is bring quality care to our patient and ensure that they're safe and as comfortable as they can be, right? But within realistic measures. So methadone helps us to achieve that, that multimodal. Be really careful with methadone though, because it stacks. So like if I give methadone every two to four hours, before long my patient's gonna be overdosing, right? Or we would have issues where they would give methadone to a patient uh, in um, pre-op, like a day surgery patient, and they just wouldn't wake up. And I mean, they, they did, they were breathing, so <laughs> don't take that the wrong way. But methadone's a powerful drug, even though it's kind of this low-state opiate, you know, oh, like everybody, methadone, they have the clinics, everything. But methadone is a serious, dangerous drug, okay? It's also considered a narcotic. So hydrocodone, 
uh, also known as Lortab Elixir, um, or Hyset. So we give this to patients generally as they are getting closer to discharge from the ICU. So think morphine, kind of like that high level, sick, acute burn patient. As they're getting better, they're tolerating their treatment room visits better, that kind of thing, then we can transition them to high set. And we'll do that for a little while, do that for a little while until we've downgraded to maybe Tylenol or maybe nothing, right? Maybe it's that machismo guy and he's like, I don't need any medicine. And you're like, well, you made this easy. Um, not that we should, but uh, we want to ensure people have comfort throughout um, their experience as much as possible. Um, Actic is a transmucosal fentanyl, okay? Fentanyl pop, uh, mipaleta, right? Um, our patients um, identify with this um, and, and it, it, it's kind of interesting actually. So we generally use these before a treatment room visit, okay? So that's where we take our patients, we have to do really a full head to toe assessment and, and cleaning of the wounds, uh, which you can imagine is a traumatic experience. And this, this transmucosal fentanyl does two things. One, it's, it gives the patient a little bit of control, right? So they have this, they, they control the, the lollipop and then get the pain relief you know, from it. And so they know this is coming. So it's kind of this self-actualizing thing. And then two, you're giving fentanyl, but without the, well, it still has risk, so don't get me wrong, but without the high risk that you would have from an IV push formulary, okay? So fentanyl, you guys know, I mean, people are dying out on the streets, that kind of thing. Little goes a long way. And you can seriously overdose pediatric patients very, very easily. So this is, in a way, a safety measure. Now, you gotta be careful, though, because with this lollipop, if they chew on it and eat the whole thing all at once, then you might run into a crisis much like you would if, if we IV push something really fast. So you do want to instruct your patients, please don't chew on it. Uh, and, and I don't know if it tastes good or anything, but um, they definitely should not be eating it. Um, kind of a slow thing. It takes you know 10 or 15 minutes to fully dissolve. Ibuprofen, that's also really not a common medicine in our formulary. Um, but it's worth mentioning, so generally we're going to give it for unresolved fever, that kind of thing. Even then it's kind of a stretch. And the reason we don't like to give it is um, just like a lot of NSAIDs, ibuprofen uh, prevents platelet aggregation. And so you want to avoid giving this to your acute burn patients because when they go to surgery, they're going to lack the ability to fully clot. And so our surgical team uh, typically frowns upon this unless there is a absolute need for it. And sometimes there is. I mean, you'll see the case. Have y'all ever seen ibuprofen ordered in the ICU? Yeah, I, I knew it was, it, it was rare even in my time, which God was five years ago. So I'm ancient, yeah, especially in internet time. I'm like dead and buried. Um, all right, so ibuprofen, uh, again, you're not seeing it too much, but it may pop its head out every now and then. All right, with kids, just as important as pain management is anxiety management. We're usually using benzodiazepines to do that. Lorazepam tends to be the staple, AKA Ativan. Um, generally, this is given um, for like procedural support. You might see it scheduled every now and then, um, but by and large, we're looking at different benzodiazepines if we're gonna have something um, on a regular schedule for our patient. Um, not only the surgical or the medical team, psychology can help us not necessarily manage all of the like pharmaceutical aspects, but the underlying reason why the child even has anxiety. A lot of it's related to like procedures and that anticipation, um, especially if the child's kind of old enough to know what's going on. You'll see Ativan, we give that a lot in the acute phase until the patient's doing better. And then we'll downgrade, if you will, to diazepam, Valium, give that for a little bit. And by the time they're discharged, not only have we cleared out the morphine, the narcotics, but our benzodiazepine as well. Ketamine. So ketamine has actually been um, a wonder drug. It's one of the top five World Health Organization medications for children. The reason ketamine is so favored is it's an anesthetic. However, 
you don't get the respiratory suppression that you do with other anesthetics. So things like propofol, yeah, we can, you know, take pain away from the patient, but you also lost their drive to breathe. So that's problematic. Ketamine, I'm not going to say it's safe to the point where you can just give it willy-nilly. Obviously, there's a lot of operating parameters in which to give it. You should be giving it under the direction of an anesthesiologist, first and foremost, um, unless you fall into some really special categories that are outside the scope of this class. So ketamine is really great for procedural sedation. And you can achieve really all levels of sedation. You can do moderate sedation with low-dose ketamine, all the way up to full dissociative state where you can literally do a head-to-toe debridement and the patient will be none the wiser, which can be a huge benefit when you have a burn patient in a critical phase and um, maybe we're out in the field or in the back of an ambulance and that kind of thing. So ketamine, as I mentioned, you don't have the respiratory suppression. However, um, for those who have been involved in our bedside procedures, you know we still preload the patients with oxygen, we still do the appropriate positioning, we still have providers close by ready to rescue just in case because while it's safer than other anesthetics, it still has a um, you know, dangerous profile if it's used incorrectly or if you just found the right patient that had the, the right reaction. Bowel regimen, <laughs> usually we don't have problems with constipation, but if we did, um, DocuSate is kind of our first round go-to. Uh, we're not shy from prune juice and things like that either, so our dosing guidelines are shared here depending on age and weight. Itching, I uh, alluded to some of this already. Diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, you will see a dose of one and a quarter mg per kg per dose. Uh, we want to be careful with uh, Benadryl, um, you know, you can get you got to be careful. Kids, kids can be allergic to Benadryl. Imagine that, right? What do you give when they have an allergy if they're allergic to Benadryl? So we don't want to just give it willy-nilly. We really want to ensure our patients need it. But the inverse is that these patients do need it. Burn survivors, basically what's happening is the skin heals. That healing process is kind of pulling all these cells together, which causes a sensation of itching. And it's, it's this self-perpetuating cycle too because they're itching, damaging that you know, cell development and growth and uh, damaging the skin graft and so they have to go back to surgery and that kind of thing. So we wanna essentially break the cycle. Well, Benadryl, sometimes it just isn't enough. It, you know, you hope that your kid, they respond, it's all good. But, oh no, we gotta do our second round. So hydro hydroxyzine, it touches on itch but in a different pathway and so we can use these almost against each other for the same goal, to remove itching from the patient. And how we would stagger that is um, they're generally Q6 hour, sometimes every Q4, no, I'm sorry, Q4. And uh, we might give Benadryl and then two hours later give hydroxyzine and then so on and so forth. And so we're just, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, back and forth. Well, that's still not enough. My God, this kid's itching like crazy. You might look and see, maybe there's some interaction from another medication, that kind of thing. So we've done our assessment, we still can't figure it out. We might add gabapentin, you know, it's gonna hit the neural pathway in, in a different way and hopefully get this guy some relief. So we can increase that. Ciproheptidine is the next line. And then uh, loratidine, God, Lyrica, um, is another drug that we found that's had great effects on itch. So this is another, you know what, Dr. Wolf should add this to his, you know, list. No, no death, no scars, no pain, no itch, <laughs> seriously. And you guys know these patients are suffering uh, with their itch. Sometimes it's worse than the pain. All right, speaking of itchy, parasites. Oof, yeah, not my favorite, probably not anyone's favorite. Um, parasites, uh, also known as fungal infections, worms. Um, we actually will treat many of our patients prophylactically. Um, having a fungal infection, uh, basically these are opportunistic and burn injury suppresses the immune system so you can have all sorts of issues that come from having these little guys hanging out in your GI tract. So we're going to give some meds. Albendazole is the go-to for us. 
Um, pediatric dosing is 200 mg PO once for children, less than two, 400 mg PO once for children over two. Generally, it's given on admission. Um, you can even, I believe, dissolve it and put it like in the NG tube, that kind of thing, if your patient's not swallowing just yet. But um, this is a way to kill parasites, uh, which usually aren't problematic, but in this patient population can very much be so. All right, moving on. Any questions on <laughs> parasites? Yeah, I, I hate that topic, sorry. All right, diuretics. So we talked about all that fluid, right? We're gonna give these patients all this fluid. Um, and generally, you're not actually gonna give diuretics during the resuscitation phase. In fact, it's almost contraindicated. Not always, but just it's a very special circumstances that they use it. But you'll see over time, sometimes we want to give diuretics. These are also falling out of favor, but uh, every now and again you'll see it. Lasix, my goodness, we used to give Lasix all the time. And um, you could like, oh my gosh, you had to clear out your Foley canister so often, um, just how much urine output that you got from these patients. Which, you know, it's good from a edema standpoint, from maybe they have some um, right-sided heart failure issues that you're able to resolve. But man, you know, talk about squeezing out every last drop. So these patients would, would not only, uh, after you give Lasix, dump all of this urine, so it helps with your eyes and nose and that kind of thing, but they're also losing electrolytes. So remember with any medicine that you give, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? So yes, we get the benefit of the fluid loss, but at the expense of losing potassium, which is the big thing with Lasix, um, but also calcium, sodium, and magnesium. And so we want to ensure if we're giving diuretics, especially the um, K-loss ones, that we are monitoring our electrolytes. Now, spironolactone, it's also a um, diuretic. However, it's potassium sparing. Now, that can be good because we're not losing all this potassium, right? <clears throat> but it can also be potassium sparing. And if you think about dilution, okay, we've gotten rid of all this water, right? Well, what's left is this concentration of potassium. So you can actually see your potassium levels rise because of spironolactone or other case-bearing diuretics. Dosing on spironolactone, zero to two, we're gonna give six and a quarter mg per uh, PO. Three to 12 will be 12 and a half, and then 12 and up is 25. And, oh good, now we have something to replace that calcium, or I'm sorry, that potassium. All right, potassium replacement. Um, this is also something that's becoming more um, physician driven. It used to be we would have low potassium levels, we'd get KCL, PO, and that kind of thing. Um, but now they're, um, they're really encouraging IV when you, know, you hit the wall. So rather than like PO supplement over and over and over and over and over again, and it really doesn't have great bioavailability, we've moved more towards um, IV replacement. But we should still talk about that PO dosing. With kids, it's gonna be 0.5 milli equivalent per kg per dose, up to a maximum of two to five milli equivalents per kg per day. Now, the reason you don't wanna go over, if we're treating hypokalemia, we're giving potassium. And so you can ex make an extreme shift from one place to the other if you're giving a high dose, especially if you're giving it frequently. Uh, and then adults, 40 to 100 milli equivalents per day, PO in divided doses. Generally, you're gonna see things like Cape Boss, uh, which is the little powder packet that's PO. KCL comes in a syringe form, I think it's a five mil syringe, based on the patient's weight, where they fall in uh, their potassium level. Now, severe hypokalemia, uh, this is a potassium less than two and a half. That's when we're gonna pull out the big guns, so obviously you call, get the order, um, and then your IV dose is based on weight of the patient. If they're less than 20 kilos, it's five millimole, 10 millimole for a weight of 20 to 40, and then 15 for weights over 40. And then same thing there, we have KCL or KFOS. Generally, it's ordered based on what the other electrolyte level is. So if your FOS is high, you don't wanna give KFOS. Um, if your CL is high, same thing. Sometimes, you're gonna just take the lesser. Like if both levels are high, generally they might do KCL. It just, it depends on the, the position. Calcium gluconate. 
All right, ionized calcium less or less than or equal to 4.5 mg per deciliter. Now, ionized calcium, you actually can only get it from uh, your blood gas syringe. Um, I know we get a serum calcium on our red top with our BMP, but we actually treat based on the ionized calcium. There's a rough estimate where you can divide the serum calcium by two, but even that's off. And you'll find a lot of times that's off because of your albumin levels. So if you want to do a fun little Wikipedia journey, I recommend kind of looking at the relationship of those three electrolytes. All right, so uh, dosing of calcium, what's that look like? I don't know, you call the doc, they tell you. <laughs> or <laughs> five to 10 kilos, 500 milligram, 10.1 to 20 is 1,000, 20.1 to 30 is 1,500, and then over 30 kilos we treat with two grams of calcium. Magnesium, very, very similar. Um, now, mag, uh, we're generally not giving as much mag as calcium, but it's just as important of an electrolyte. It's just, it seems like these patients just can't get enough calcium. I mean, you could probably run it all day and still not get up to level. They just use so much of it. Mag, so uh, your dosing's low. Um, we'll want to go ahead and give more. And actually, if your mag concentration in the blood goes up, so does your calcium, or your ability to absorb calcium uh, is increased. So dosing, uh, 5 to 10 kilos, we're giving 250, 10.1 to 20, 500, and so on and so forth. All right, albumin, um, this is something we're also not giving quite as much of. Um, albumin is uh, great as kind of this supplement in your vascular system. So maybe you have a little bit of hypotension and you want to give some volume. Um, you know, albumin can be good there. It's not good for malnutrition. So mal malnutrition, you think um, pre-albumin levels is something that we draw on these patients and then we'll try to get them up to speed over time so we can avoid refeeding and yada yada. So albumin, serum albumin is more a quick fix, right? Like we're just trying to get the albumin level up temporarily, whereas, you know, good quality nutrition, that's really how you're going to get your um, pre-albumin and then your serum albumin more consistent over time. However, there are some indications in which you would give albumin. Sometimes we push it like in code situations and that kind of thing. Uh, in general, we're not giving it in the resuscitation phase. It's not always true, um, but just again to support vascular volume uh, where indicated. All right, high alert medications. So I pulled out, um, this is from a policy, but these are some of our drugs that we give relatively frequently. So there's some I really want to highlight. Um, Adorax and Ativan, thankfully they come in two different formularies, right? Adorax is our itch medicine. It's uh, hydroxyzine's trade name. Whereas Ativan, and that's oral, Ativan comes in a vial. Although not always, there's actually, there is a PO version of Ativan. Um, but again, you want to kind of pay attention, right? Diazepam, lorazepam, not only do they sound close, but they're actually in the same class of drugs. But two different things, right? Like maybe they ordered Valium, but um, I gave them Ativan. That's what we've been giving for days. And honestly, that's like where we get into trouble. It's like, I've been taking care of this patient over and over and over again. So of course it's going to be the exact same way that I did it yesterday. But that goes back to make sure you review your orders and actually go through and, and make sure you have the right thing. Dopamine, dobutamine, uh, same thing there, you know, and especially because we're not giving them all the time except in like code situations. So uh, easy to make F, uh, mistakes there. Uh, your code drugs, or I hope not. Phenylephrine and uh, epinephrine, which uh, we don't really use phenylephrine or it's not something that nurses for the most part would be managing. Uh, hydrolyzine and hydroxyzine sound close, two different medicines. We don't give a whole lot of steroids, but methylprednisone and prednisone are not the same. Uh, phenylephrine and pseudoephedrine are not the same. Zantac, some cold medicine, versus Zofran, which is something we definitely do give, right, for nausea, vomiting, that kind of thing. Okay, Zofran, here it is again. And Zosin, another thing that we give pretty often. Yeah, you know, I know the difference between my Zofran and Zosin, but you know, all it takes is one mistake. And then polymyco and silvamyco, um, just close in name. They're different enough in texture. Um, if you haven't figured it out, meet me after class and I'll give you the whole rundown. All right, patient medications. So we wanna ensure that when patients bring their own medications, 
we actually put it into our system. So pharmacy checks them in, they get checked into the medical record, and then you will actually give the patient's medicine through the EMAR. And I know it's a little bit of extra work, but that's again that check and balance to ensure that there's minimal, if any, interaction between the patient's home medication and then the treatment plan we're giving them here. Um, that can be kind of tricky, but um, it's best to incorporate it into the system rather than hope for the best. Um, herbal dietary supplements, you heard me talk about this already. Just basically, we want to be concerned for, we, we, we would like to know what are the patient's natural remedies, what are they bringing in, what are they incorporating into our treatment plan to ensure that there's no interaction between them and what we're giving. All right, in summary, take time to familiarize yourself with the selected medications. I know it's a lot. These patients get so much. Um, you'll learn it over time, but uh, until then, please make sure you're asking questions. Use those resources available. LexiComp is great. They have drug guides. You can put them on your phone. If I haven't showed you, I'd be happy to, to show you that. I know I've talked to a couple people. Pharmacy staff are available 24-7 to meet the needs of staff, patient, and caregiver. Um, make sure you know your six rights and then review those prior to administering any medication. Be alert for changes to orders and that goes back to yes you've taken care of this patient, you know, it's your third shift in a row, but orders change, sometimes they get missed in the review process. So just first thing, do that systematic review of everything. And then if you're in any doubt, please seek clarification. It can be with a charge nurse, a pharmacist, a physician, your educator. Um, we're all here to support you and uh, ensure that our patients have safe quality care. All right, any questions?